So uh, thank you, first of all, Thomas, for uh, inviting us to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Really appreciate the invitation from the organizers, and uh, we're excited to share uh, our exercise with you. Uh, so first off, I'm going to talk about uh, the center, give you guys an idea of who we are, what we do. Um, so to do that, I'm going to go back to basically uh, you know, back in history a little bit, talk about the, uh, how Estonia regained their independence. Uh, at that time, Estonia had to decide what type of uh, society they wanted to become. Uh, they decided that they were going to uh, invest in the efficiencies of a digital society. So to do that, uh, you know, they had to uh, really concentrate on uh, coming up with digital services, platforms that were accessible to people, uh, you know, things to make people's lives easier. So they did that, and as they were progressing through that uh, period, you know, early 90s, uh, they found out that making a digital society meant that you had to deal with a lot of vulnerabilities, uh, potential attack vectors, everything like that. They realized that they weren't the only nation that was going to invest in the, uh, you know, the, the digital society. So in 2004, Estonia actually went to NATO and said, hey, we've been de uh, developing this digital society, and we think that we can share some of the lessons learned that we've had with the alliance to make the alliance stronger. NATO at the time was actually involved with the uh, war in Afghanistan, and uh, they acknowledged the fact that uh, a digital society was something that most nations were developing, uh, but they didn't think that it was appropriate for NATO to take those steps. They thought maybe the EU would be more uh, of an appropriate venue. Uh, so Estonia uh, stepped back, they approached the EU, but as time went on, you had in 2007, which uh, Thomas had already mentioned, uh, the first politically motivated cyber attacks against Estonia. From that bad experience uh, came good. Uh, on, in 2008, Estonia reapproached NATO and said, hey, look, we still have this idea for a cyber defense center of excellence. We want to establish it in Estonia based on the experiences that we've had. And NATO accepted. At that time, there were six member states. Uh, we've grown significantly since then. Right now, we're about 60 personnel. Uh, some of the things that uh, people don't realize when they see our name, uh, it's, a, it's a bit deceiving. We have the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. We're actually not a NATO body. Uh, we're not part of the NATO command structure. We're not part of the NATO force structure. We're actually an international military organization with a, a, an MOU with NATO. So essentially, you can think of NATO as our preferred customer. The other piece that a lot of our visitors are uh, confused about is we're not an operational center. So we're not real-time stopping cyber attacks. We're more of a think tank organization. You can think of something like RANDS. We do research, training, and exercise. So I'll talk a little bit about our mission and our vision. Uh, our mission goes back to that first C in our name, the cooperative piece. Uh, our director always likes to talk about uh, since our establishment, we, we were a powerhouse in cyber. But over the years, we've grown small. And what I mean by that is that we only have about 60 personnel where there are a lot of nations within the, the NATO alliance and our partner nations that have set up cyber commands. And you talk about thousands of people working on cyber issues 24 hours a day. How are we, we, how are we unique? It's that cooperative piece. Uh, we're able to bring in uh, industry partners, academia. Uh, we, we have member nations from uh, right now, it's uh, 30 or 25 different nations. Uh, we look for dependencies. Well, how does the civilian sector provide uh, operational capability to the military? We're lucky enough to have professionals from all of these different nations looking at uh, cyber from a 360-degree three, point of view. We're looking at uh, the law. We're looking at operations, technology, strategy. So that's where we get our, uh, our, our competitive advantage in the, in, in the cyber world. So here, you can see our sponsoring nations and contributing participants. The grayed out flags over here are actually member, station, uh, member states that are, have put in their application to join this uh, Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. You can see here we have contributing participants and sponsoring nations. The big difference between the two is that each year we go out to NATO and our partners and we ask them for uh, what do you want us to do research, training, and exercise about. They come back to us with a request for support. Those requests 
for support are brought back to the center, and we basically rack and stack them based on what we think is most important to the alliance, what we have the resources to do, uh, what we have uh, the subject matter expertise to do. We come back to the, to the nations, and we say, we would like to do this research training and exercise for the year. These nations, the sponsoring nations, are all NATO nations. They actually have a veto power uh, when we come up with our program of work. So if all the par contributing participants think that we should do research training and exercise in uh, artificial intelligence, then one of the sponsoring nations says no. We don't do any research training or exercise in uh, artificial intelligence. So our focus there is research training and exercise. We basically do that through our content branches. We have technology, strategy, operations, and law. And ideally, we spend about a third of our time in each. So we get uh, new members of the center. We train them to become subject matter experts through their research. They develop courses that come uh, as training. We deliver that training to our member nations. And then we test how well they've understood the training in our exercises. So our research, this is just a, 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 a smattering of our research. It's generally uh, you know, focused on the different focus areas that I mentioned previously. This is uh, a representation of this year's program of work. So these research areas, they change based on the desires of our steering committee. Our steering committee decides what we do research training and exercise on. We have input into that by saying this is what we think of the latest and greatest trends in cyber. But essentially, all these things here, these can change from you know, year to year. So for instance, when you have something like the uh, cyber effects in the battlefield, NATO has just recognized that cyber is a domain of warfare. It's on par with air, land, and sea. So we needed to train our commanders, our military commanders, how do you use cyber to have effects on the battlefield? So that was one of our research areas. Our training, our training is pretty diverse. It goes along with our, uh, basically, our, our branches. So based on, uh, cyber is basically a, a new domain for NATO. So we've developed uh, courses such as the Cyber Executive Seminar. And the reason that we uh, developed this course was we realized that many of our senior leaders, they don't understand cyber. A lot of them think it's kind of like magic. Uh, so. We need people to be able to uh, make solid decisions in the cyber domain. We developed this course to get uh, flag level personnel, your admirals, your generals, ministers. We've even had uh, ambassadors come to this course. And it's more of a sit down, round table type of course where it's a discussion. We bring in our subject matter experts. We talk about a certain topic. And the idea isn't to get uh, you know, these senior leaders to be subject matter experts or you know, uh, really deep dive into this subject. It's just so that they have enough information so that when they go back to their staffs, they can ask intelligent questions to get the information that they need to make informed decisions. The operational piece, as I mentioned before, NATO just uh, recognized cyber as a domain of operations. Uh, so we teach courses uh, ranging from critical infrastructure to intelligence gathering to how do you, you know, put cyber into your operational planning. Our legal course, uh, that's one of the things that we're probably most known for. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, we developed a talent manual. And essentially, our law course looks at uh, how cyber, uh, you know, how cyber is interpreted in international law. And then, of course, all of our technical training. Uh, these trainings are offered to all of our member states, basically uh, for no cost. So these technical trainings are on, you know, par with SANS level training. Uh, and you can see we have a, a variety of courses. The only limitation to uh, the amount of training that we do is, we, first of all, we have a small staff. We've only got so many seats, especially at the technical uh, level. You're talking about 15 people probably behind you know, uh, command line learning this stuff. And we can only offer these courses uh, once to twice a year, mostly twice. But still, we're not, uh, when you think about how many NATO nations and partner nations we have, we're not hitting as many uh, participants as we would like to. 
So whenever we have, we actually have a lot of people come uh, visit the CCD COE, and uh, we always talk about our flagship projects. Uh, today we're going to concentrate pretty heavily on, on lock shields, so I won't really get into that. But uh, one of the precursors to lock shields was an exercise that we did uh, called Core Swords. And it's uh, interesting the way Core Swords are developed. Uh, we as the NATO CCDCOE, like I said, we don't fall uh, underneath the uh, NATO command structure. So we're able to uh, press NATO on issues that NATO as an alliance may not be comfortable with. One of those issues was offensive cyber. So we brought up an exercise. Uh, it was interesting enough, we uh, wanted to call an offensive cyber exercise, but the alliance overall was not comfortable with it yet. So we developed a penetration testing exercise. It was called Cross Swords. Uh, so this exercise uh, basically found out who the real good penetration testers were in our community of interest, and then we actually employed them for lock shields as our, our red team. So it served a dual purpose for us. It kind of moved the needle on you know discussing uh, penetration testing or you know offensive cyber operations. Plus, it gave us a, a, a very good workforce for uh, lock shields. One of the things that uh, I'll also mention is the Talon Manual. Uh, I, I talked about it a little bit before, uh, but this book, uh, we have two iterations of Talon Manual, Talon Manual 1 and 2. Uh, the first Talon Manual was basically uh, a look at inter uh, how s you know, cyber uh, can be interpreted in international law. A lot of our adversaries wanted uh, us to look at uh, cyber as a completely new thing. So international law does not apply to cyber. A lot of Western thinking was like, uh, hey, we've already got a lot of international law established. Let's figure out how cyber fits into that mold. So we came up with the Talon Manual. And essentially, we invited uh, lawyers and academics from around the world to come contribute to this, uh, ex or to this, uh, to this book. And again, it's basically an academic uh, view on how cyber law is interpreted, or, or cyber is interpreted in international law. We made Talon Manual 2 because Talon Manual 1 basically looked at all of the instances that crossed the threshold of war. And what we realized was that a lot of the cyber events would not trigger like an Article 5 type of response. It would not trigger war. So Talon Manual 2 actually looks at all of the events that are below the threshold of war. You can think of things like the Sony cyber hacks. And what we, what we uh, hang our hat on for this uh, book is that, uh, you know, if you're, cyber, if you're in a a position of authority and a cyber event happens to you, uh, uh, you know, uh, to your nation, you can see how the rest of the world would interpret that within an international law. SciCon is our international conference on cyber conflict. Uh, we hold it every year. You can see down here. Uh, it's in the May time frame. Our next one will be uh, May of 2020. So essentially, we invite uh, senior leadership, uh, practitioners, uh, subject matter experts uh, from all over the world to come to Tallinn. The conference is always opened by the president of Estonia. Uh, so the way the conference is set up is we get the geopolitical uh, atmosphere uh, where cyber is in the world. So we have senior leaders come talk about that. And then we break into smaller, more in-depth, uh, you know, we'll talk about the law, or we'll talk about operations, and everything like that. Uh, we have some very high-level speakers. The conference has become uh, so popular that uh, we, we're always sold out. We, we have about 600 seats each year. Uh, we actually had the Army Cyber Institute at West Point from the United States come to the conference and ask to establish a SciCon US. So now, in addition to SciCon in the May time frame, you can go to the United States and uh, visit SciCon US. It's a joint venture between both centers, the Army Cyber Institute and the Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. And uh, you can get the same type of content, you know, because we all know that cyber is very dynamic, things change very quickly. Or the fact that uh, you know, some people from Europe may not be able to get to North America and vice versa. So at least you can get uh, the same type of content on the, uh, you know, at least once a year. So Cross Swords, I, I mentioned this uh, already, but uh, Cross Swords is an offensive cyber exercise. What we've been doing recently, uh, the big difference between Cross Swords and uh, Lock Shields is the, the offensive defensive piece, but also Cross Swords uh, is not as scalable as Lock Shields. As you'll hear from uh, the rest of my colleagues, we're able to uh, train a much larger audience 
uh, for lock shields. Cross swords, what we're trying to do is practice uh, you know, the actual planning and execution of an offensive cyber exercise. We've been working in conjunction uh, with Latvia. Uh, we've worked it with uh, kinetic forces. So what I'm talking about is like your special operations forces. Uh, they'll be integrated into the actual planning and execution of the exercise. So you work through a, a, a problem set. You may get to a point where the, you know, the, uh, the, the cyber piece is stalled and you want to employ uh, special operators to maybe advance the exercise. So it's a, it's a good uh, opportunity for NATO as an entity to plan and execute offensive cyber operations. Okay, so lock shields. I'm going to set the scenario for uh, just general understanding of what the exercise entails. Uh, and then I'll pass it along to my colleagues, but just to put uh, a frame around it so people understand a little bit better if you've never heard of the exercise before. Uh, so every spring, uh, uh, an island called Borrelia pops up out of the North Atlantic. Uh, Borrelia is its own nation state. It's a NATO member and an EU member. Uh, Borrelia is uh, it's a pretty new nation, so they're, they're having their struggles. They've got uh, an ethnic minority that uh, creates some trouble on their island. Uh, and they're also being influenced by another entity. The entity is called Crimsonia. A larger state, you can imagine someplace on the right of your screen, starts to influence uh, uh, Borrelia and their, the, the way their government operates. Borrelia realizes this, so Borrelia reaches out to uh, its friends and allies. Uh, you know, and essentially, the friends and allies provide Borrelia with a, a deterrence force. A deterrence force is actual troops on the ground on the island of Borrelia. So from the scenario pers perspective, you've got the, the good side, Borrelia. The bad guys are Crimsonia. Uh, on the island of Borrelia, you have, a, like I mentioned, that ethnic Crimsonian uh, anti-Borrelian community. And then we also introduce other actors, different nation states, to add to the scenario. For Lock Shields uh, 2019, uh, what we had, as I mentioned before, you've got your deterrence force advisors actually on the island of Borrelia. So every nation that played had some physical troops on the island. There's been uh, recent political turmoil in Borrelia. Borrelia just had an election. The uh, elections have been contested. Uh, people are getting angry because they think that their votes have been manipulated. So you have a, a, a general uh, upset populace. To add to that, Crimsonia, a much bigger nation, has just uh, finished a military exercise. So they've got an abundance of troops, equipment in the area within striking distance of Borrelia. Borrelia, along with uh, ABC, the anti-Borrelian or uh, anti-Borrelian community, uh, is very good at uh, mixing cyber and information operations, getting the most out of, uh, you know, uh, basically creating chaos and mayhem with the local populace on the island. Now, during this whole thing, so Borrelia's, uh, you know, th they're having to deal with their public, the public's upset. Borrelia actually experienced a natural disaster. So uh, there's been a uh, terrible torrential rainfall that has uh, drenched down the Borrelia. Uh, it's caused some, uh, some difficulties with some of the networks that Borrelia uh, depends on to run their state. Uh, it's also forced the Borrelian uh, government to spread out forces to go help with humanitarian aid type of things. So right now, the Borrelian government is pretty much stretched thin, and uh, they're on the brink of uh, falling apart. Because of this, Borrelia reaches out to the nations that are actually playing uh, the Lock Shields game, and they request a rapid reaction team. That's that RRT right there. And what the RRT is is the actual game players. Uh, the, the nations playing from their home uh, countries that are the blue teams. So when you think of RRT, Borrelia just asked for the blue teams to VPN into their network and help. And with that, I'll hand it over to Thomas. Thank you, Mike.